On August 9th, 2018, Kerala, a state in India, suffered the worst flooding it has ever suffered in history. 483 people died. One million people were displaced from their homes. 20% of a country with a population of 35 million were directly affected, including my family members and people in my community. My grandparents and my parents watched in horror as people that we knew, people in our communities, people in our cities, were hurt by this flooding. But this came during the monsoon season, and India had been equipped to handle this for centuries. Floodgates were built, dams were built, communities were centered around handling the monsoon season. So what changed? The Water and Climate Lab in IIT, India's top technical university, ruled that it was exclusively due to climate change. Climate change is what exacerbated this flooding. Climate change is what caused this destruction. Climate change caused sea levels to rise and the water cycle to change and for all of this destruction to be wrought. There were a lot of crazy things that happened in India at the time as a result of climate change, and natural disasters were perhaps the biggest problem. So it was really on August 9th, this day, that I decided I wanted to make a full project out of researching and combating climate change. Climate change is absolutely the world's worst and most unifying problem. There's nothing I can think of that affects every human being on the planet, every piece of land, every non-living thing, the water cycle, inanimate objects, animate objects. Everything is hurt as a result of climate change. So tackling it is one of our biggest tasks. There's a lot of examples of climate change affecting our world right now. The Himalayan ice caps, for example, as reported by the International Pl Panel on Climate Change, are predicted to lose two-thirds of their mass by 2100. They supply two billion people in Asia with clean water. Even if we cut carbon emissions drastically, they're still going to lose a third of their mass. Basically, we're screwed if we do and if we don't. The nation of the Maldives is a sovereign nation, an island in the Pacific that is literally sinking underwater. When I visited India back in 2013, when I was in fourth grade, I saw families from the Maldives fleeing to my community because their homes were destroyed by flooding. Hurricane Harvey was ruled as a result or exacerbated by climate change. Top climate scientists from around the world looked at Hurricane Harvey and the flooding that happened and saw that climate change had caused this problem. So one thing to remember for the audience is that everybody here knows climate change personally. So what did I do? I made two neural networks. I'll explain what they are. They're really complicated computer programs. I predicted the impacts of climate change. I inputted prerequisites of human health, which I'll also talk about. I mapped the results of my network so we could see them visually, and then I proved some necessary policy changes. So as we go into the speech, there's a few takeaways I want people to focus on. First, on climate education and general knowledge. I hope by the end of the speech, you guys know a lot more about climate change or how to predict it. So my favorite show is Game of Thrones, and I like to compare climate change to the White Walkers from Game of Thrones. The White Walkers are this giant looming threat that nobody knows how to deal with and are just a gigantic force that nobody in the world is dealing with properly. And even more than that, most of the world doesn't even believe that they exist. In fact, in the last episode, spoiler alert, they literally take an undead creature, drop it at the feet of the queen, and she still doesn't do anything about it. And that's really applicable to what's happening right now. With all the data we give to policymakers, nothing significant is happening. Second, hopefully uh, there, you guys get interested in possible activism. And activism means a lot of things. The other day, I was scrolling through Snapchat, and I saw on a friend's story when it was snowing in Hawaii, wow, Hawaii could really use some global warming now, huh? That was one of the saddest things that I saw that day. So I had to slide up on the story and tell them, hey, this is incorrect and here's why. And that's a form of activism, even if it's the loosest possible form. When you see somebody saying something that is ignorant, you should take that opportunity to educate them. And actually going out with a picket fence and marching is also the most definitional form of activism. But all of this is something that you guys should be interested in. Third, if you guys get interested in this from a research standpoint, I'll actually be really happy because this is the nerdiest speech that you're going to hear all day. And if some of you in the audience see this and think, hey, that guy's cool, hopefully at least some of you think that, then research is going gonna, is gonna to be what drives us forward. And then finally, if I did this, what could they do? They being the professional climate scientists in our community. So I'm not the smartest guy. 
I'm, I'm really not the brightest guy. I don't have a driver's license, so my mom has to drive me around. I don't know how to talk to girls. I'm barely passing math. And I wore these goggles till seventh grade. I don't make the best decisions. So if I did this, a kid who wore these glasses till seventh grade, without any resources or professional help, then when we actually put resources to the professionals, we can do something much better. So first I'm going to say why I'm up here, next why it matters, and then finally why you care. So there's a lot of problems with human decisions, and I'm going to explain what a neural network is. A neural network is based off human decision making, and you might think humans don't make the best decisions. Look how many Instagram followers Kim Kardashian has, how many albums Lil Pump has sold, how many movies we let Michael Bay make. But I assure you, we are the best critical thinkers on the planet. And when we combine the advantages of critical thinking, of human consciousness, with the logical decision making and mathematical advantages of a computer, then we have the best predictive tool possible. So let's take an example of how a neural network works. Let's say I'm trying to decide if I should go to the pool. Going to the pool is my output. So I have a bunch of different inputs. Do I have to take my sister? Is the weather OK? Did they finally clean the pool? Is my summer body ready? Is that really annoying lifeguard who's always blasting his bad music there? And are there any good Netflix series to binge? These are all the important decisions that I have to take into account as I look at my final decision. This is exactly how a neural network works. It takes various inputs and tries to map them to an output. And all the program does is figure out the middle. It has to figure out the relationship. This picture, even though it looks kind of complicated, is really basically how it works. It has the inputs, it has the outputs. The job of the program is just finding the middle. So there's a few different benefits to neural networks. For example, looking at these graphs, there's no simple algebra 1 y equals x line that's going to fit these graphs. You have to have something much more complex to describe it. And neural networks can find that mathematical relationship. Fault tolerance is a big one. So if you have data that's an outlier or bad data that you're putting into the program, the program itself can recognize that. That's something insane that neural networks can do. The data that you put in in the first place can be recognized as good or bad by the program. And then finally, self-editing. If anybody has even taken a precursor, pre-AP class in computer science, you know that you have to type out the program. And then if there's any bugs, you have to go through and find them. When you set up a neural network the correct way, you can f the neural network finds it out itself. It's able to edit its own program to make it correct and get better over time. It's a program that can edit itself. Uh, that sounds a lot like Terminator, and it probably is if we give it enough time. But it's an amazing, amazing tool because we are not making it better. The computer itself is making it better. So for my neural network, I had a bunch of different data that I had to take into account about climate change. So first, looking at stuff like summer warming and daily heating. Across a sample size of 20,000 people in the US, this obviously happened all the time or most of the time. That's the definition of climate change. Temperature, temperatures are rising. Things like wildfires, as we see in California, increase as a result of climate change. That's something else I was able to measure. The ozone, the thing that protects us from the sun's rays that cause climate change, is deteriorating right now and exponentiating the problem. Again, we can measure that. Carbon emissions, which come from factories, from cars, really from everything that's a machine, are happening at an unprecedented rate right now and not being regulated enough. Hurricanes, like Hurricane Harvey, are exacerbated as a result of climate change. Flooding, like Hurricane Harvey and in Kerala, are exacerbated as a result of climate change due to more hurricanes and more sea level change. One thing that's important to notice is cold waves. The hots get hotter and the colds get colder. So cold temperatures, like the polar vortex that we saw, are also tangential results of climate change. Everything is out of whack. Then other things like sea level change and erratic temperature swings are also things that I measured. So basically, all of these categories that you see on the screen, I took and then I put into my program. I mapped them to a bunch of different outputs, like death, disease, all of these things that are going to affect us. And I had a three-pronged purpose. First, I wanted to accurately predict the results. Second, I wanted to make a software mapping prerequisite conditions of health. And finally, I wanted to prove the dire needs to mitigate climate change. So first. How accurate was my network? My network achieved an accuracy rate of 70%. And while that doesn't sound like much, I would say to you, first, hurtful. Second, it actually is very, very good for a network of this size. The next closest network of this size dealing with this problem achieved an accuracy rate of only 50%. So remember what this network is doing. 
this network is literally a prediction of how climate change is going to affect us in 30, 40 years. This is the best predictive tool for the future. I don't have a crystal ball or tarot cards, but this is the best prediction for the future that we have right now. And at 70% accuracy, that's insane because these major impacts of climate change are going to be what we're needing to stop. And this is the best way we can do that. I had a really low error rate and an accuracy rate of 70% is better than anything else we have. I chalk that up to spending a lot of time working on my training function and my data. Basically spending my entire summer, instead of going out with friends, I sat in my room in the dark, huddled over my laptop, typing away and altering my code. All these minuscule variations in the code ultimately made an exponentially better program. So basically, I was able to make a really accurate predictive tool. Second, I wanted to map the prerequisites of human health. What does that mean? Well, obviously, Human health isn't just a simple linear correlation. There's a lot of things that affect how we are affected. If you're really old versus a person that's 20 years old, obviously the person that's really old has a weaker immune system and is more susceptible to disease. So that is something that I was also able to put into another network. So all of these things that would affect you when climate change hits us, how close you are to water, how old you are, how poor you are and your access to infrastructure, all of these things can also be measured, put into a network, and then mapped out. For the second network, where I use these prerequisites of human health, I achieved an accuracy rate of almost 70% again. What that means is we have the first predictive tool that looks at the prerequisites of human health and the first predictive tool that's this accurate. So I'm firing on all cylinders here. It's a great network, and I was really happy with it because it's a unique network as well. And also, I made it a software. So a program is really something that you use once to achieve a purpose. A software, like an app that you have on your phone, is something that you can use over and over again. So this neural network can be used over and over again. You can put in whatever data you want, whatever climate data you want, and get a better relationship. Over time, as you keep doing it more and more, the neural network itself gets better. So I was able to make an accurate software. So I accurately predicted the health impacts, and I utilized prerequisite factors. Finally, why does it actually matter? Well, for policy, we want to make sure that we have a predictive tool to map it out. And I was able to develop an important map to show us where climate change is going to hit the most. Houston, where we are in southeast Texas, is almost in a red zone, so we are disproportionately affected. Places like Arizona and Southern California, within 30 to 40 years, there will be severe results. In 2016 alone, in Southern California, there were multiple disasters. And in the US, there were 15 disasters that each cost $1 billion or more. This is only getting worse. Looking at the final impact, area, impact areas, again, looking at our county, Harris County, we are disproportionately affected. We are in an area of high impact. So by actually being able to map out these accurate results that we have right now, put them into a program and then put it into a map, we know what's happening and we know where it's happening. And that's the best way to guide policy. So if we're making laws, we want to know where those laws are going to have the most effect. So uh, in this speech, I showed you really what I spent my time doing, developing this neural network. And hopefully, there's more things that you learned on each takeaway. On climate education, maybe I didn't change your mind on climate change as a whole. Maybe you support politicians who don't think it's that big of an issue. But you should realize how important computer science and research is in climate change, and really in life itself. Developing arguments to predict and know what we're doing from a mathematical or scientific standpoint is the way our society moves forward. On possible activisms, hopefully, as a result of this, you know ways that you can educate, especially here in Houston. Two days ago, we had a major student climate rally, and it's important that we act here, because in Texas, we're disproportionately affected. In research interests, Hopefully some of this piqued the scientific side of you guys and you want to research more into climate, climate change and realize how important the research is. And then scientists' abilities. So kids in the audience, you guys can write to lawmakers and hopefully try to convince them to do something. And adults around donating in climate, climate initiatives is really important. But what about your abilities? So without a year of research on climate change, an intimate knowledge of computer science, or sacrificing your social life for development, what could you do? Now, if you can't tell from the aggressively long name, I'm Indian, and even though it's kind of a stereotype, and I hate stereotypes, I love computer science and I love programming. But I know that's obviously not true for anybody, or for everybody. So what can you guys do? Well, at least you know something, so at the very least, do something, and at least do what I did in the very beginning and get to Googling.
Thank you.